born here in Denver. Uh, at the time, there was only two hospitals that we could go to. And that was Denver General and I think it was called Colorado General. My father's name was Frank. Uh, I'm not a junior though. Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to be. But uh, they didn't get the license. Uh, they didn't get it on to the birth certificate right. So my name is Frank L. Smith. My father's name was Frank Smith. Mm -hmm. And my mother was Maddie. She was uh, originally from Texas. He's originally from Mississippi. He got to Denver by way of the railroad as one of the, he was a member of the, one of the first protest groups, um, which was the sleeping car uh, porters and waiters. Um, and my mother, she, uh, I don't know how she, I don't know how she got it. I never thought of that. That's interesting. But uh, this is my daughter, Cherie. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us. What is one thing that you remember about your childhood house? What's that? Cooking. Cooking. Uh huh. He's a gourmet cook. I cook. Oh, nice. That's, uh, well, uh, now, let me say this. From where we live, from City Park, we can hear every night at about when it started getting dark, you can hear the lines. Ooh, ooh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, ooh, ooh. And the peacock. Have you ever heard of peacock? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and to grow up living in a neighborhood like that, you got to understand that it's just absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. What is something that you are really proud of from your life? Accomplishing the family business. Mm -hmm. Nice. Being able to leave a family business. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's, uh, you know, being, I, I'm really surprised that uh, because I mean, that, that she chose, because she had a choice. She could have went to college. She could have done some other things. But she told, chose to be in the business. So uh, being able to leave her a business or guide her to be able to sign your own paycheck is the way I put it. Mm -hmm. And that makes a big difference. She can make as much money as she wants to make. So, I mean, that's a fact. Mm -hmm. So it depends on how hard you want to work and what you want to give up to get it. Mm -hmm. But signing your own paycheck is different than what well, you got to imagine. It's, I've done it all my life, so. Mm -hmm. And that's including the time I worked for Jeremac and KMS, which, you know, two national companies. I basically signed my own job description, wrote my own job description with them, hadn't been written before, so I had something to bargain with. Yeah. All right. What is um, a word or maybe a sentence you would say to describe um, your wife and your mother? Uh, Phenomenal. Uh, Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Yeah. It's been just a world who, I mean, I was still growing. So that's the whole thing. That's beautiful. Yeah. Boredom is as not struck as yet. Hopefully it won't find us. Yeah, it's never boring. What would you say is the most important ingredients for community? Uh, Coming together. Yeah. Coming together. Being able to not judge by what you heard or what you think or uh, what what might be a situation I don't want to be involved in. So you put in a lot of love and time and patience. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of the recipe for making something strong. Mm -hmm. So unity. And that's what has to be as long as you're a minority, you got to do that. So whereabouts in Denver were you living at the time? On 27th and Lafayette. 
Okay. So that's, you know what that is? Yeah, yeah. And so then that was, uh, that was a black neighborhood. It was integrated at that time. In, in, in 1940, 41, where I can start remembering, the house next door to us, Buffalo Bill used to live in. Before. Buffalo Bill. Oh, wow. <laughs> And and he he had owned that house and then he moved bought another house down in the next block on the corner and that's where he lived until he got sick and died. Or, matter of fact, the house that was next door to us where he lived had a metal hitching post that they left out in the front yard. Oh, that's cool. And up till you know, I got pictures of cars, you know, with the hitching post sitting there next to the cars. In, in our block, uh, everything back then was about the neighborhood. Uh, you know, I mentioned to you about the burning crosses up on um, Castle Rock, but uh, we didn't have to go out of the neighborhood for much of anything. The doctors came into the neighborhood. They made house calls back then. Mm. And, um, they everything that you wanted people came to your door to give it to you the watkins man the fuller brush man uh they had ice boxes so when you hear the word ice boxes these are were real ice boxes which was just a box lined with metal and you kept ice in the top that's how you kept the whole thing cold so you had ice man that brought ice around to your house once or twice a week. You used to have ice pick and you chipped off the ice to get what you wanted for your drinks. So you got one big piece of ice and be floating in there and that was heaven. <laughs> but you could get everything on credit. So there was not anything that you couldn't buy just sitting in your front room. These houses are all brick. Two stories, mostly. Uh, some of them in every block there was what we would call castles. They'd be three stories, four stories. They're selling for a million and a half down there now. Wow. So um, they had a highway through there. Mm -hmm. Colfax was the main highway coming through the town. And what was, what, that was the dividing, dividing point. What was the reputation of Colfax at the time? Oh, it was very reputable. That's what all the business was and stuff back then. Mm. Everybody drove up and down Colfax because that's where all the big businesses were. Uh -huh. uh, it, it wasn't nothing, you know, they used to say, like the area you're asking about, um, if it doesn't happen on Colfax, it doesn't happen in Denver. Well, one of the one of the first things that you was always taught was that you have to be twice as good as a white person doing something in order to be as good. So you had to excel at what you did. Right? And so, Cherie, would you say that your father taught those same messages to you? Oh, yeah. He would always tell us to come so he can tell us what he went through and he would sit us down and watch movies, we would fall asleep and he would get mad. <laughs> How did you get into that industry? Like what was the, what was I, the inspiration? I started in beauty school and uh, after I had gotten out, I did two years in, in the Navy Reserves. This was right out of college. So after I stayed at home, after I moved back in with my family. Uh, so this is like the 1960s or so? Not quite to that, almost. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's the beginning of the 60s. So um, she, my mother was a, a hairdresser and she just uh, said, well, why don't you go be a barber or something and you can use that to pay for your schooling while you're going through uh, college. And uh, I decided to be a hairdresser and 
fell in love and I've never worked. I've signed my own paycheck uh, for the rest of my life, 60 years. Wow. What is it about, about that work that you really loved? What did you love about it? Oh, women was the first motivation. <laughs> <laughs> it really was. <laughs> I don't think I made any money doing it every free for the first two or three months. <laughs> And uh, once she got through school is when she met this fine fella. Oh, that makes sense. Yes. The hairdresser connection. Yes. Uh, and, and so... She was raised in the shop. She was... How was the beauty shop? She'd get, out, she'd get out of school and the rest of her night was spent in the beauty salon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when well, that was the second phase, that's what it was. Another phase. <laughs> so we had uh, three salons and they were all phases. Mm -hmm. You know. So you had right. other phase, phase one and phase two? No, it was phase two. Another phase and final phase. And final mm -hmm. phase. <laughs> nice. Okay. I had a salon, a very popular uh, salon be before I went to Jeremiah. Matter of fact, they had invited me to do a show. And that's where Jerry Redding was there. And he, you know, invited me to come to apply for a job. Mm -hmm. So um, the salon that I, I was already in national competition, I'd be all over the United States. Very expensive uh, ordeal going to state competition. So you don't see a lot of hairdressers in competition anymore. They just, uh, they make the money, but it's not, you know, to be directed toward getting fame. Because there's only, generally only two reasons that you want to, that you deal with in hair, and that's either fame or fortune. So you do a lot of different things and be very famous and not have no money. Or you can make a lot of money and nobody knows who you are. Uh-huh. We're still very, very known regardless, you know. Um, Frank, I, he, he, people will come to me and I, I don't even know what, who they are, but they know me. And they'll <laughs> say all the things that they done done with him and the shop and this. And I just look at him crazy like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, he he's very known. Um, I think he got both uh, best of both both worlds, to be honest. And so, what was happening in in the in the black community in Denver as far as hair around the time you got involved? Well, you know that's really funny, but uh, the beauty industry is still one of the most segregated industries there is. The hairdressers, in other words. If I'm giving a big wedding, my hairdresser has to be there. Mm -hmm. Graduation, my hairdresser has to be there. My hairdresser, you know, so um, this is... You must have gone to a lot of weddings and graduations then. Yeah. <laughs> That's part of it, you know. So It's a um, community kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, the more important that a person is, you know, about yourself. Uh, the hairdresser has to be there. It's like your doctor has to be there or something or whatever like that on that level. So... Jeremac really changed the scene. Changed the whole revolution. Mm -hmm. the thing, I didn't go to Jeremac with the idea of inventing a method to do the, a, 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 a curl. That's what it was called at the time of curl, but it's just a permanent wave. Mm -hmm. But they hadn't been able to permanent wave black hair up to that time. So what my job after I got there was to figure out how to permanent wave black hair. But it couldn't happen anywhere else than here in Denver because this was such an integrated society. In other words, we went to, when, when we go to beauty school, we learn and work on white customers. So they don't have the heat work, the curling irons and stuff 
at the schools because they don't they're not prepared to do black hair. So like black white hair dresses are the same thing that blacks do, but 90% of them will tell you they don't know how to do black hair, but they get the same schooling. Yeah. Were most of the people at your school black people, most of the students? None. I was the only one. Oh, what was uh, what was that like to be there? I saw a black person was when they came in to do the floors or, or dump the trash. So it took me three years to get out of school because I worked in the summer and, and you know I wanted it. So mm -hmm. whole different way to sell products. And that's what Jeremac took control of with the girl. Just revolutionized the whole in the first year that uh, I was with them, they made $11 million and we hadn't even come out with the curl that year. They taught the chemistry of hair, the chemistry of the body, so that it, it was a helpful thing. It was problems that I wasn't able to solve in the beauty industry, different hair, scalp problems and so forth. And they did it from a health standpoint. So that's how I ended up with them. When we came out with the, the curl, it allowed a lot of salons. JC finished the big salons like Regis and all of those, cutting up, uh, cutting hair and the cutting salons and stuff. They were able to do black people or wanted to do black people because that's where the money was. White salons never, white hairdressers never thought there was money in black hair until then. So it changed the whole economics of hairdressing. Product-wise, they didn't have big companies that were interested in investing in black products. But now, all of them got black products under pseudo names that you would never know. Mm -hmm. And around what time did that change take place? Uh, 70. Five seventy four. Uh, I think we, we hit the market with it in seventy five. We had, I was, they gave me an educational team, and I had to hire eight more, uh, four more people. So that made eight of us that were out there doing shows. Day and we might be in Chicago in the morning, do a show, start at eight o'clock, and we'd be doing another show at five o'clock that evening in, in Atlanta. Wow. So they were usually four hour shows because doing the curl world was a lengthy process. A really exciting time that you just happened to be there at the right moment. That's it's what it was. And there's no way you could have predicted that you would have had that boom. No. And so you're doing these shows and you're like flying from city to city. And <laughs> you were in front of a live audience. Yeah. Be six people. You know, when we started having shows, they would be sold out. Like I said, we were sold out a year ahead of time. So, now, did this impact the entire economy of Denver? No, the world. Michael Jackson was on stage, and he went to do one of his little stunts and leap off the stage. He leaped between these uh, stage lights, right? OK. And he had somebody's product in there and it lit up and <laughs> they were oh, crying, you know, just, terrible. You know, like they had they had that of him. But I mean it just burned his head. His head was on fire. Oh my god. But that was the product that he was using to make it curly and shiny. Uh-huh. <laughs> it wasn't our product. Thankfully. What was Denver like by then? Had it changed since when you were? Uh, Denver was still segregated as far as the beauty market was concerned. Although, I mean, like, we were the first uh, one, the first people to have an educational team in the national state registry uh, education level. So we were the first to be able to go into the national show and give educational classes. 
Mm -hmm. certified for that. So the uh, market was here. You know, nobody ever thought of Denver as having, being prejudiced. And it's like I was telling you, a permanent wave is a permanent wave. The ability to understand how to do one hand should apply all the way through, but it doesn't. You can go in a salon today, they can't refuse you as being black, but if they don't, they, they're not going to tell you that, uh, they're going to tell you, we don't know how to do black hair, but you're welcome to sit down and we'll work on you. Mm -hmm. If they refuse you, there's a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. Right. But they don't know how to do black hair. So you wouldn't want to go people. there anyway. Huh? You probably wouldn't want to go there anyway then, right? Uh, well, yeah. it's a salon that's in your neighborhood, it's very prominent. Mm -hmm. All your girlfriends are, are, are white, and they go to this salon and they keep telling you about this, you want to go too. Yeah. But there's nobody there that can do your hair. Mm -hmm. Or that wants to do your hair because they have to learn. It's like going to school again. Mm -hmm. So. Did you feel like the thing that your mother told you when you were young about having to work twice as hard, do you feel like that applied to your career as well? Absolutely. Absolutely, for sure. For instance, there was a hairdresser, like when I started doing national competitions, which are mostly whites, very few blacks in the national in the big competitions. And um, they, the idea that, that there's only one or two blacks out of the whole nation that would achieve certain levels. And it was because of the amount of money it is spent and it's back to that fame and fortune thing. And yes, you did have to work twice as hard. They didn't believe, they wouldn't believe that, you know, black can't do right here. And mm. I was beginning to right off there. The idea that we're slow here in Colorado and, you know, compared to other states, we don't have that, that initial drive Personally, myself, you, you when, once you get used to space, you enjoy space a lot better. You respect it more. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's like having quantity and quality, I guess. So. Yep. As we as we start to wrap up, I'm curious if there's like any anything we didn't get to that you guys want to share or um, yeah. No, I think Pops hit it all. <laughs> 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 <laughs>